Okay, so the second method is decanting. That's what's being shown here. So for this method, it's gonna be exactly the same as before, we're gonna grind down into this slurry. With this method, you can grind finer because we're not gonna be pouring through anything. And so you're gonna grind down your slurry. You're gonna pour it into a jar up to halfway. You're then gonna to top it off with fresh water and then you're gonna stir it up as much as you can. That whole mixture is gonna settle down like you can see, you can kind of see there's like a layer of starch in here. There's gonna be this tannic water in the top. Once that has settled, you're gonna decant that water off the top carefully so you don't just pour all your mixture down the drain. You're then going to fill it back up with water, stir it again, and then repeat that process until it's done. The way I started doing this was to just do that about once a day. That's an easy rhythm to do. I keep this in the fridge, this whole process, just because you want to avoid the fermentation that's gonna happen. Uh, but again, weather dependent or whatever, like you could do this in a root cellar, it would be totally fine. So you can, you can pour that water off as soon as it has settled out. So you can pour the water off three or four times a day if you're around and have the time to do that. With white oaks, this method is gonna take uh, anywhere from three to about five or six changes of water. But again, do not trust any numbers that anybody tells you. Another thing I've heard a lot of people say is, you do it until the water is clear. If that's not right, you don't wanna do that. With white oaks, the water is basically never gonna be clear. If it is, that means you've washed out all of the starch out of all of it. So again, your tongue is what's gonna tell you that that tannin is gone. With red oaks, this method is kind of marginal. For me, it took about 14 or 15 changes of water with red oaks to get, to get them leached fully where I would eat them as a major component. This, I, I guess, uh, just as a little bit sort of random interjection, but I've, so I've sort of come across a lot of either, you know, in print acorn instruction or people teaching classes, and I've heard a wide array of people's take on how to get things leached. A lot of the stuff I've come across seems to be based on people's experience doing this once or twice a year in the fall. And so that's where these first two methods came from, is me sort of researching and learning from people that are sort of on that scale. Once I got to the point where I was like, okay, I've figured out these initial steps, I wanna eat acorns every day. So I realized, like I was saying before, red oaks are the one for that because storage is so much easier and they're higher fat, but this leaching method, it just kind of doesn't really cut it. I've come across a lot of people that teach acorn processing and teach people that red oaks are not edible because they're too tannic. So the method that I found, which is actually an adaptation of the Miwok folks method of you know those Californian folks, um, is percolation. So this is basically the same idea as the decanting method, except that rather than having to pour the water off repeatedly, we're just letting the water run through continuously. So exactly the same, grind down to a slurry, but we're gonna take a colander of any type. The one in this picture is kind of nice. I like to teach with just because it's got these wings on it and so it sits in a sink very easily, which is where we want it. We're then gonna line that colander with any sort of cloth can work fine. I've seen people do it with pillowcases and t-shirts. I use this flour sack towel because it's made to retain flour. Um, so I grind down to a slurry, I line the colander with that cloth, pour the slurry in, and then drip water through until it's done. 
And so that drip of water can be, so really that drip of water, this is part of the reason that this is a little bit step up method is that there, again, there's a learning curve in learning how to drip the water through and it's based on what cloth you're using essentially. What you're going for is you want that mass to stay wet without water pooling up on the top. If you're getting water pooling up on the top and there's like a full layer of water, that means that water is finding other ways out of that cloth and it's not actually pulling through the mass of the flower. If you get it all tuned correctly, what's going on is there's a capillary action where the water is continuously pumping in and out of the whole mass. And so even though there's just one drip of water coming through and then one drip of water coming out, the whole mass gets fully leached. With white oaks, it's anywhere from one to two days is what I've done. Um, with red oaks, it's anywhere from three to four or five days, three to five days. Um, again, your tongue is what's gonna tell you whether it's done or not. So with that colander specifically, because it's a nice rounded shape, I've had no issues just letting the drip run and not doing any stirring or anything. With larger, so I, at this point I use this uh, like seven gallon fish fryer. And so it's got like a flat bottom and angles on it. I wind up having to stir stuff up just because there's weird sort of pockets that form in there. Didn't have that. So can you briefly tell us what they used? Right, they used a, so they would make a mound of sand, a fine sand, and they'd form it into a bowl. And then they would line that bowl with woven grass mats. And then they would pound the flour down to be super fine. And they'd put it on that mat and then they would pour water with like a, a conifer branch. They'd pour it through a conifer branch to sort of break it up um, and then just keep pouring water through until it was done leaching. So same idea, the sand is the colander, the grass mat is the cloth, and the water is the, the sink drip. Same idea, different tech. Yeah. This is kind of a side topic, but I was wondering if you know of any consequences of having like a large amount of tannins go into your water system like afterwards. Like yeah, definitely. Good point. So tannin is organic compound, breaks down very readily in any organic biology. So most leaves that come off trees are pretty high in tannin. So breaks down really efficiently. Not a big deal. Is it what I, at all for the bottom? Um, I mean, I, would, I don't actually know what it breaks down into, but it's, it's not like any potent fertilizer or anything. Um, what I, so in the other, so like in the hot water method or the decanting method, what I would do with the water is pour it into our washing machine and use it as a detergent. Works really well. There's usually a little bit of starch in there too, so, yeah. Is this method or this step prone to fermenting if it's not kept cool, like the decanter? I have not had issues with that. Well, I, I, I feel like I had an issue once with it fermenting, but I th and I think what was going on is that the cloth got very clogged with starch and so the water wasn't moving through very well, and it was like the middle of summer. So everything just sort of came together to make it an issue. But other than that, because the water's moving through continuously, I haven't had an issue. So is the way you changed your method so that the starch didn't clog the, the fabric? Um, I, 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 my partner did something. She like cleaned the cloths very well, essentially is what happened. <laughs> we also bought, you know, that was at the point where we were processing like huge amounts of flour. And so those cloths had each processed probably 50 pounds of flour or more. And so I also bought a new set of cloths.
So yeah, to some degree, this is acting like a filter and it's gonna be disposable. I've seen people pull this method off on where they will take uh, the mash and they'll put it in like a pillowcase and tie it on a hose bib and have the hose bib dripping inside the pillowcase and same idea, drips through the whole mass and that seems workable. I guess another thing that I would mention is that a lot of, you know, one of the methods that gets a lot of hype and that I have seen people use is leaching in a creek. So you can put the mash inside uh, some sort of cloth bag and then set it in a running creek and then just let it run until it's done leaching. Uh, when I've tried that, the issue that I had is that the outside of the mass would get fully leached and then start fermenting before the inside got leached at all. So a similar idea, it, starts, it sort of makes this cap on it where like the water's flowing on the outside and pulling everything off, but the inside's just never actually getting any water running through it. Uh, like essentially what I think is that it's too much water and a sink is basically a creek with a flow valve on it, so it allows you to fine tune that. Yeah? So essentially, the, the only way to really get the bad tasting or astringent um, properties out of it is by grinding it first in the mash. You can't just... You, with white oaks, you can leach kernel halves, like the way they come out of the shell. You can do that. I haven't successfully done it any way other than hot leaching, and it's gonna take more changes of water. But for me personally, so the leaching is gonna be way more efficient if you can open up surface area. And for my purposes, I wanna use it as flour. There are people that, you know, like I've had people tell me that they've made like roasted acorn kernels Personally, I don't think that would be that tasty because they're so starchy and just kind of bland. Um, but again, I don't like chestnuts at all. Some people really love that sort of texture and flavor. Um, another thing is I know this guy who makes a acorn hummus and I can't even really remember why, but for some reason he wants larger chunks before grinding it down into the hummus so he leaches larger sizes. So it's do and for that you also you don't need that starch. So you can hot leach and that would be fine. So yeah, the cold methods, the decanting and the percolation are really most crucial so that you can get a flour that's going to hold together in baking. Also, at least my personal sort of flavor preference is that I want as much fat as well mixed into my food as I can possibly get. So I want there to be really fine acorn flour so that I can get lots of fat in there. <laughs>